Welcome back. Hope you all got to enjoy that little break. Next up, we have Anna presenting on monitoring global data privacy developments through open source intelligence. In her own words, she is a tech policy, privacy, and security specialist with extensive background in helping companies and organizations meet their compliance and regulatory needs. In her spare time, she does enjoy reading and writing and drinking too much coffee. Take it away, Anna. Thank you very much. Oh, OK, this is perfect. Uh, hi, um, first of all. Thank you, Dan Initiative, for giving me this opportunity. I'm a big, big fan of this conference, and I'm just happy and honored to be here. And this is my topic, so let me get started. So first, I'll introduce myself a bit. I'm a political scientist by training. I studied political science at the University of San Diego. I'm a former public servant. I'm based in Mexico City. I was at the Mexican Foreign Ministry and at the Mexican Data Protection Office for some years. And I decided to pivot into information security and privacy a few years ago. But as part of that experience, I learned all about tracking, monitoring, and keeping track of global developments by using all kinds of tools and techniques, which I will talk to you today, specifically as a part of privacy. Currently, I'm a compliance manager and a data protection uh, officer. Yes, I have both roles at a software as a service company with clients across Latin America. So my challenge as a privacy officer is keeping track of any sort of privacy development where it's a new court decision, regulatory decision, all kinds across this region. Um, as an information security person, I'm currently um, learning a lot about OSINT and preparing to be, uh, take my CISA certified information security auditors exam. And just on a personal note, I'm a big lover of sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. I especially like to write about these stuff. And um, just a quick disclaimer, of course, anything I say today is my own. It should not be um, any blames, should not go into my employer, any organization I feel with, or my dog, Ollie, who you can see right there. So first, um, understanding the problem. And the problem is privacy or data protection or whatever you call it is a topic that is changing very fast at a global scale. And it's a lot to keep track of. You have new regulations at a national level, at a subnational level, at a regional, at a state, sector specific. You have judicial and court decisions. You have changes in technology, uses and trends. You have guidelines issued by regulatory bodies. You have all these things to keep track of as a privacy officer on top of everything else you're already doing for a company or organization. So I found that this is quite a problem and often people end up just kind of responding ad hoc, like, oh, wait, there's a new issue here, there. And the reason why I kind of developed the system and why I'm presenting it today is this is the way of making information through very, ba very, very basic OSINT come to you. So this is very accessible. Almost all of the tools I talk about today are free or have like a free tier. So let me begin. So first you need to you know, define OSINT. And I'm talking about a very narrow area of OSINT. I know it's very, very broad. There's all kinds of amazing uses for it. Um, thank you, <laughs> uh, Michael. And what I'm talking right now is specifically about tracking information. So here, I really like the definition from a fall place of the Wikipedia entry, which is open source intelligence. Is the con oh, sorry, Suze. thank you. Is the collection of analysis and of data gathered from open sources to produce actionable intelligence. And the um, Wikipedia entry outlines a few information streams, which I will talk throughout this presentation, which are mass media, internet publications, uh, government information and data and commercial data and gray literature. What I like about this definition is it gets to the core of what is the information that's gonna be most useful for a privacy professional in terms of monitoring changes. And what I found in my personal experience is that mass media is very useful to keep track of the big picture changes of like the new regulations, big picture things, but usually, you know, it's at the surface. It's GDPR this, or uh, Shrimp's 2 decision turns out, um, validates uh, Privacy Shield, that sort of thing. It's very big picture. So then you have internet publications on citizen media where, you know, social media fits into this category, or you can get a bit more nuance. Um, it depends, but I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, then you have government and public information. It can help you detect new regulatory guidance, standards, or official documents. Um, 
this can be very important if you're like me working in an area where you do have regulators and who issue binding stuff all the time. So you need to keep track of that in order to ensure you're in compliance. Then you have professional and academic publications. Shout out to all my privacy lawyer friends because this is where lawyers really shine by going deep into nuanced conversations about topics. Sometimes these are useful, sometimes these are not, it depends. Then you have commercial um, literature, which is great for getting industry trends and practices, maybe how competitors or others in your industry are dealing with privacy problems. And then you have gray literature, which is everything and anything that doesn't quite fit. It's um, patents, it's working papers, it's papers that haven't been published. And I find these are great for finding super niche stuff that you might not find anywhere else. So with that, I'm going to start talking about how you are going to use um, OSINT to make all of this information come to you and make things easy. And I talk about do, you doing this as a process from diagnosis through planning through evaluation. So as part of that, I talk about the good old Deming cycle approach, which is plan, do, check, act. I add a preliminary stage, which is the diagnosis stage, but I think that could also be a part of your plan stage. Um, I found this to be a very useful in terms of framing everything I do in terms of privacy programs. So first, you, of course, you start with your diagnosis, and that is your W questions, your who, what, when, where, what. It's basically how you figure out what you need to know. And the best way to doing this, in my opinion, is just to go through all your company organization's documentation on privacy or anything related and just kind of go through it, analyze it, study it, um, go through your privacy policy, any cookie policies, privacy working group diary, uh, documents, any regulator, uh, regulator recommendations that may have been issued to you or your industry, anything that could be relevant, go through it. And what do you mean by go through it? Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about like how you're going to break those topics down so you can get the keywords that will help you track um, developments in the space. So what I like to do is use guidance questions. These are a few that I've come up with, but you can come up with your own questions. You can look for questions online. What you want to get at with these sort of guidance questions is break down to all those core strategic documents into keywords, into key topics that you need to follow, like what you absolutely need to know from your privacy notice in terms of monitoring, keeping track of changes. So for, here are a few questions. I'm not going to go through them all, but um, my presentation will be up, and you can always DM me if you want to see any of these. But let me go through questions one and three, because I think these are very useful to getting a bit of context. So here I have, is the company or organization subject to any data protection privacy regulations at a national, state, local, or sectoral level? What are these? Just very briefly, because this is a public or, um, presentation, I, um, I gave a little brief answer for myself for my company. So it's a wide range of data protection laws across Latin America, including Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Argentina, and Brazil. The laws that currently apply are the following, and that would be a very, very long list. And what it just didn't come up quite right because it was supposed to highlight the keywords, but here my keywords would be data protection, Latin America, the countries, and the insert list. Um, I'm sorry, that highlight works work, worked weird. But what I get at is in like very few sentences or maybe a paragraph or two, kind of like an abstract, you want to get to the core thing um, of what you're trying to find because that's how you're starting to start to know, go from this is my privacy program as to these are the specific aspects of my privacy program that I need to get track of and that I need to monitor. And to give you a bit of context, I, the second question right here, what are specific technologies, data, platforms, and other resources that are key to your business? And my answer would be as a payroll software as a service provider, PII related to human resources, employment, and other processes related to payroll, HR, and related issues. I know this is very big, but here like my keywords would be payroll, uh, software as a service, human resources, PII. These I would go through and like actually circle these words and kind of circle my answers and break them down. Because as I go through that, I'm going to I start seeing common terms. I start seeing obviously PII and privacy, but also like where I covered, what areas are there? Um, well, it's human resources and that has implications in terms of what kind of data does that mean? Well, that, I know that means 
banking information and full names and that sorts of things. And that's where you start getting an idea of what are the key things you need to keep track of. And just a bit of advice when breaking down documents, again, do whatever you want. Um, try to make them comprehensive without being too heavy. Don't get too in the weeds. The key goal is to get some key words out of these. So um, with that in mind, it doesn't have to be a big comprehensive overview, just like a few paragraphs about your company's general goals or whatever you think you need to know, um, whatever will guide your um, um, privacy program will help a lot. So in talking about keywords, um, it's very important because like keywords will become trackers. So I like to think about it as the keywords as the what and the trackers as the how via the whom. What do I mean by these? So a keyword is something for me like privacy in Latin America and the tracker is me following some organization who talks about privacy in Latin America and whatever that means. It might be Twitter list, it might be an RSS feed, it might be um, via a Google or some other aspect, but it's connecting your keyword as with who is doing the work on that and who is in the weeds on that so that you can follow them or track them in the way that you need to and they will get the information to you on the changes that you need. And a little bit about just how to generally do this, um, based on your diagnosis, you go through the keywords. I like to quite frankly use Excel and word clouds to give me an idea what is the most important things. You can use big data analytics tools. You can use all kinds of tools. Um, you wanna have at least 10 to 12, I would say, keywords that you can play around with as you start to figure it out what, it, what is best that will guide who you follow, what you subscribe to, and how you set up your information streams so that information comes to you. So now we get into the plan sta uh, planning stage, which is actually establishing the resources and trackers. For that, you wanna do two things. Think about what is best for you and your organization and where the information is. So it's a balance. Sometimes you'll have to, the best way to find information is via social media, quite frankly. Twitter, extremely useful. Sometimes it'll be subscription feeds or alerts. Sometimes it might be another resource. I tend to focus on the first two because those are the ones where I find in the privacy space to be more useful than perhaps some big awesome tools, which I'm still learning about, so I'm not sharing, maybe next year. Um, but like social media and subscriptions and alerts, RSS feeds, those two are where I find a lot of the information that is valid and actionable. And now you get to the meat of it, which is setting up the trackers. Um, I like three having two to three places where you're gonna follow information. Do it, you can do more. I wouldn't do any more than five um, because it gets chaotic. It gets hard to keep track of everything. I've lately come to use and find that Twitter lists um, are super useful. I find social listening tools, which I will talk about in a minute, also useful, especially if you're not sure who's actually doing the talk, the talking on your keywords. Um, my advice there is just, you know, plug in your keywords as hashtags, follow them for a while and see who comes up. What are the anal basic analytics on that? And you have RSS feeds, which I personally love for this purpose. Um, I'm a little bit old school. I find them super, super useful. I, but um, again, you can do whatever you like. And then you have Google Alerts, um, newsletter subscriptions. You have stuff like Medium. Again, the sky's the limit. You want to figure things out. You want to organize things in a way that's best for you. My recommendation is try to keep it minimal because if you it's always better to scale up than have to scale down because it's very hard to kind of figure out what you can eliminate. So, so you get a bit of context. Here's one of my tracker list. So as I mentioned, one of my keywords is privacy in Latin America. So I made this Twitter list that has a, a lot of, a little bit of follow some users on privacy in Latin America. And what I have here specifically because I am subject to a lot of regulations, is the regulators. It's straightforward. It's I have the regulators from Peru, Chile, Argentina, Mexico, who is my old employer, and Colombia. And basically, that is um, that. And I have it set up this way because I know 
when they publish new regulations, when they publish new guidelines, they tend to at least share them on Twitter or they tend to at least share links to them. And that's a way that I can kind of keep track of when I need to know something instead of having to go individually to each of these websites. I know this is super simple, but when you're like updating your privacy program and you want to check it, that everything's in line, these kind of lists can make it very, a lot easier to find information. And I quite use this list quite a bit. But you can also go through really niche lists. Like I have one that I call GDPR stuff because that's a topic for a whole other conversation. But GDPR is kind of the basis for a lot of Latin America and you know, much in Latin America and it's a lot more weak, it's a lot weaker. But um, if you follow GDPR, you're kind of in compliance with most of the regulations. So my organization made the decision to kind of follow GDPR as the basis for a lot of things and then kind of tweak from there. So I follow a lot of GDPR stuff. I have what I call my privacy peep section, which is um, experts, leaders, commissioners, people who tweet about privacy, whose content I find useful and whose nuanced talks. Um, you can go with expert list. I really recommend if you have, are subject to any sort of niche regulations like HIPAA or CCPA or something like that make a list out of the niche experts. So all of the HIPAA experts you know and trust, add them there, because that's gonna be your first sort of step in catching up with new guidelines, with new issues, because th those are the people who are doing the talking or the organizations. You can also follow organizations. And then I have what I call my privacy dumpster fire list, which is my list where I have everything that doesn't fit neatly. It's kind of like my inbox list where I have everything that may go to another sub list, but it's a way of sort of keeping track of things, people, organizations that I think are useful or think are important, but don't fit neatly into my other boxes. And as to how many lists I like to use on Twitter, I like to have that somewhere between five and eight um, with, with each one having up to 12. Um, a little less if if it's people who tweet a lot, but um, you want to keep them relatively concise because that way you're not getting a lot of clutter and a lot of, um, unless you have one person who tweets a lot, then you might make them into a like a smaller list. Um, but yeah, 10 to 12 is a good number for people who are tracking and still having content and keeping up with changes. So in my next slide, I have here um, a screenshot from my tweak deck. Tweak deck is a, I think it's a Twitter tool. It's a social analytics tool. Um, there's some others. I've used Hootsuite. I've used um, HubSpot. HubSpot is especially great if you don't know a lot about social media because they have some great tutorials. Um, both of these are, you know, not free, but they have free trials. So sometimes if you're starting up and you just want to figure out who's doing the talking on the topics on your keywords. Those are gonna be some, you know, use those free trials. I think social listening tools basically help you gauge where the conversations are on a given topic. For example, here I have privacy, data protection, data privacy, privacidad, which is privacy in Spanish, and privacy by default. And what I'm doing here is every so often, I'm checking in, seeing what hashtags are trending, how they're trending, um, getting a little bit of information on that because that will help me figure it out not just whether my keyword is right, but also who is doing the talking on my keywords. And quite frankly, are my keywords like framed exactly the right way? For example, I don't have protección de datos, uh, which is data protection in Spanish, even though that's the main term most leg legislators use. Because that term doesn't, it's not really used on social media. So I have privacidad, which is kind of a strange thing, but I prefer to have that as my keyword because even across Latin America, that's what regulators will use. I'm guessing is a number of characters in a hashtag issue because that will influence, especially with non-English non um, languages. So, you know, you're gonna wanna play with social media in this sense. Um, you wanna see what works and what doesn't, again, I've done a lot of trial and error with this, so you, it's all, it's all about playing with the systems and how it is easiest for you to make the information kind of come to you. And finally, I have my beloved RSS feeds, um, which I know a lot of organizations no longer support, but I still love them. 
And I love them because it makes them so easy to go through information. I could just look at like the headline and know if something's going to be relevant for me or not. Um, this screenshot is from Feedly, which is an RSS reader. I quite like it. You can use anything you want. Um, I like it. I like Feedly because you can make sort of list up to a certain number of people you're following your feed. And if you go to the top of your feed, you'll get all of their recent publications. So you can go through things really fast and you can save um, what you need to save on boards and just delete everything else. So through Feedly and just following, like I like to follow a lot of regulators on Feedly. I like to follow a uh, thinking on Feedly. That makes it very easy to just quickly you know, go through information and be like, oh, there's this new guidelines here. Oh, there's these new um, requirement here. Oh, this decision um, impacts me here. And just kind of save that information and dump everything else because we don't have the time to read everything. I wish we did, but I know we don't. And as you do, um, you're going to be want monitoring. You, once you set up your trackers, you want to start establish a period as to how often you check in with them. I like weekly. I like checking in with them on Friday afternoons where things tend to calm down at my office. But whatever works for you every two weeks, every three weeks, every month, um, I recommend at least once to every two weeks. Um, you want to eliminate everything that's useless as fast as possible. Just get it out of the way. You want to also establish some set locations while you while you store the information that is useful to you. You want to do this so that you're not like hunting information like, oh, I saw this. I think it was here. No, you like have one set location for RSS suites, one set location for tweets, one set location for subscriptions. Um, folders are great for this. So that you know that like you're not checking 10 different sources. At most, you're checking three to four binders. And finally, you actually want to check in with these binders or formats or folders or whatever you want every once in a while and like just go through them, see what information is useful. Sometimes you'll find you stored something two months ago that might be useful to you now, but wasn't that useful then. It was just like, oh, this is good to know. And I think that can help you like also not have to go hunting down for information. Finally, we get to the check and act stage again. So with anything you want to check, is it working for you? Um, it's really hard to gauge on the abstract. Um, I think the best way is for you to check your own system in terms of what you set up. But you want to see, here are some guidance questions like, is it helping or adding to your burden? Um, do I have the outcomes I need? Am I catching the things? Like, did I catch the regulations? Did I catch the fine on a competitor? Did I catch what I needed to catch? Are the trackers working for you? Are they actually po posting on what the topic of your keyboard is? Like, one my example, if I were to follow a tracker that had protección de datos instead of privacidad, so data protection instead of privacy, I might not find much because most of Latin America will actually use the term privacidad, at least in social media. Um, are my communication mechanisms enough? Are things slipping through the cracks? Am I getting the information I need? Am I getting too much or too little information? You're going to tweak that. And based on that, you start over in terms of act and applying and checking. And you want to be strategic, or as I call it, call, um, be a critical kitty. I think being self-critical is very important. And engaging our work is only good for you um, in the long run. So finally, these are a few lessons learned from my experience of all these years tracking both political developments and we are now very specific stuff on privacy. Um, simple tools regularly work, um, right, that are well set up and fine out and um, so simple tools that are regularly set up um, and well done, well, well applied will be better than complex tools. I've found this especially with big organizations. They'll have big tools uh, that they want you to follow, but sometimes the information won't be right because it's not tailored to you. Um, and what I like about this stuff, it's all cheap or free. Like at most, you might want to do a subscription to something, but that's about it. I don't subscribe to anything. Everything I've shared of, I've paid for nothing. Um, be ruthless in eliminating what information doesn't serve you because otherwise you get a lot of clutter. This is very important when setting up social media accounts or email accounts. You want to use um, 
you want to use very specific and a specific an account specifically for that. You don't want to use your regular account or your personal account. Use a SOC account, use an anonymous account. I'm using the at privacy penguin account for this. And I, I just started it for this talk. I think I'm going to start using it for resources. So follow that if you like. Um, mix and max your trackers and start up scale. And um, don't be afraid to scale down. So just because I'm running out of time, here I have some resources um, that I found are useful. Again, it will depend on your organization, but it is just go through it, look things up, check, test it out. That is my best advice. And hopefully what I talk to you today will help you make the information come to you. I'm always open for questions and concerns. You can find me primarily on LinkedIn and Twitter. And Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Suze and Michael for your support throughout this talk. Um, thank you very much.